inside the dream. All right, everybody, welcome back to Honored Madman. I hope you're all doing well. So today we've got a bite-sized video that's part lore video, part follow-up vid to yesterday's Albanoric Encyclopedia. So we're going to talk about the Oracle envoys and their possible connections to the Albanoric's uh, evolution cycle, as well as just what they are, what they do, and their connections to previous ages. So seeing these guys abruptly appear in the lands between playing their song, it's not exactly a common occurrence. In fact, here's what the description of their ashes has to say about them. It first refers to them as a monstrous band of musicians who employ the sacred arts. It is then said that when the Oracle envoys appear playing their pipes, they do so to herald in the arrival of a new god or a new age. So I think the most common assumption here is that these guys appeared heralding in the new age of the new god, Mikola, who seems to have won this Game of Thrones unless our player character has anything to say about it. And it's possible the envoys themselves don't exactly know what the new age is or who the new god is, they just know that they're supposed to appear right now and play their song. Garbed in fine white fabrics and wielding horns of unalloyed gold, the larger ones noticeably wear a black Under Armour shirt beneath all the white fabric. They've certainly got an odd look. And they're beings of extremely strange anatomy. They bleed white, they have this silvery whitish skin they've got a great circular gut in place of where their legs should be and they drop strips of white flesh what's even more curious than their snowman style lower halves is their elongated necks which is most notable on the bigger ones and how their arms sprout from the base of their neck in a rather strange manner not unlike that of the wraith callers who have no shortage of arms although i don't think there's much of a connection there it's worth noting though that these envoys have a sort of bluish silver discoloration on their arms near the shoulder and on their necks. And the wraith colors do have a sort of bluish skin. Personally, I think the connection is simply between the albinorics and the envoys, but you might think otherwise. Although one thing the wraith colors and the oracles do have in common is just how obscure they are. They're very mysterious creatures. And both groups invite a lot of speculation just on where they're found. Anyway, so the Oracle Envoys have an extremely alien appearance. Now they're said to be quite rare, which makes sense given what they represent. They're only found in two places in the game, Lane Dell, the royal capital, and the branches of Mikola's Halleck Tree. And sure, it's obvious what the ones in the Halleck Tree are doing there, but what about the ones in Lane Dell? They seem to be focused on Grand Sax's corpse. I could be wrong, of course, but perhaps that could mean that they are signaling in the new age of Godwin the famous undead demigod who was once a good friend to the dragons. I think it's at least somewhat a possibility because he's sort of rising again as this new undead god of the dead of those who live within death. But that's something I should probably ponder in one of my upcoming weekly rants. Let's get into the finer details of these envoys. So I believe these oracle envoys are an evolution of the Albanorix. They've got the same skin, same long, skinny arms. The Envoy's arms even get more blue towards the shoulders, which is similar to the silver color of some of the Albanorics. Their white cloth garb seems to incorporate a circular pattern, which I think represents the silver birthing pools that they came from. It's even got ripples. They also wear these silver earring things and silver brooches that keep their hoods secure and even silver bracelets which resemble the ones worn by that snake who wields the magma whip in Volcano Manor. Although the Manservant wears them as anklets as opposed to bracelets, probably because they've already got a cool snake themed bracelet, but anyway. The middle brooch curiously incorporates a sun-like design, although it might not be depicting a sun. But I think all of this jewelry is to pay homage to their silver-based origins. It's similar to how the female wolfback archers wear that silver armor depicting the Halleck tree. They also appear to have evolved past the use of their legs, which obviously the Albanorix are famous for their legs failing on them, which I think seems to imply that these aren't necessarily an evolved form of all Albanorix, but just an evolved form of the first gens whose legs were known for failing. And if this is indeed the case, it seems as though the metamorphosis may have stretched them out a bit, but on the flip side, it did make them younger again. Maybe it's a fair trade. And again, I could be completely wrong on this. These cocoons could just be how Albanorix are created after their birth from the birthing pools. Maybe it just spouts out a uh, cocoon of some kind. Now, I don't think that's likely. I think the uh, alternative that they're turning into the oracles is a bit more interesting and uh, my preferred theory, but either one is possible. 
because the oracles, they are mysterious and they invite speculation. And they don't appear to be of the Erd Tree either because nothing about their outfits suggests that they have any affiliation with the Greater Will or really anything golden aside from their horns. Well, and their bubbles. No, the description of these horns all share a description that they can't be played by a mere human even though we can play them and use them to great and devastating effect. The description also suggests that perhaps it's too early to sound, which I think indicates that the rather obvious fact that Mikola hasn't returned yet and that he won't return until, what is it, uh, June 22, I believe? Now, I highly doubt these uh, horns will gain any special abilities after we download the DLC, but who knows? Probably not, though. But anyway, back to the oracles. But how did they get this way? Well, something that was brought to my attention in the comments of my seminal hit, the Albanoric Encyclopedia that released yesterday, was that there's these cocoons strewn throughout the Halleck tree and its town of various different shapes and sizes. Now, I never paid these any mind really at all. I thought they were just little decorations, which seems pretty short-sighted of me. My brain probably thought they were spider eggs, forgetting the fact that there are no spider enemies in the game. But after being told in my comments that what was in these cocoons was actually albinorics, it made me go investigate. And sure enough, look at that. That's blatantly a first-gen albinoric who sort of just slumped over, you know, in the way that they do. But it's cocoonified and all webbed up. So it looks like a good amount of albinorics, the first-gens at least, did make it to the Halleck Tree proper, where they followed their master Mikola into a cocoonified state perhaps to emerge better and fixed, changed, if you will, much like Mikola presumably will be. And I think some of these cocoons began to hatch, and out came the Oracle envoys. Now, how they got their horns is a mystery to me. Maybe they just produced them out of thin air, or maybe they crafted them. Maybe they just knew exactly what to do when they emerged from those cocoons. And I think their hatching sort of signifies the eventual hatching of Mikola, which itself would usher in a new age as he's an Empyrean, someone who's qualified to replace his mother, America the Eternal. The ones in Landell also could just be signifying Mikola's return, but I really do think they're signifying Godwin's, and that perhaps Godwin was expected to be Mikola's consort. I mean, we know they were friends, we know that Mikola did everything he could to try and resurrect Godwin. He even dedicated all of Castle Soul to the task. So that's kind of what I think their song is for. It's kind of for both Mikola and Godwin. And obviously, I don't think Mikola intended for Godwin to die. That seems to be a part of Rani's plan that Mikola didn't account for. Just like I no longer think Mikola planned to get kidnapped by Mog. These are all just unforeseen outcomes that happen to the best laid plans of Mikola and possibly Godwin and maybe even Merica. But again, that's all stuff I can get into in another more ranty style video if this one isn't ranty enough. I do think the Oracle Envoys have to be some sort of next stage in the evolution of the Albinorix. Again, at least the first gens, if nothing else. Which reminds me, in yesterday's video, I forgot to mention that there are some of those dumpling-headed Albinorix in Landell Royal Capital in the sewers. And honestly, I don't know how I could forget that, but there's a, a lot of stuff in this game and uh, I really should write more things down. And it's not hard to assume why those Albanorix are in Landell. They were probably just captured Albanorix who were tortured by loyalists of the capital. We know the Erd Tree has no love for anything silver, especially uh, sentient beings that are silver based. So while I do think that they are the next stage in the first gen Albanorix evolution, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is the only way oracles are created or that it's the only way they've looked. I mean, it could be, but I think it's just how they're choosing to appear in this cycle. Perhaps it's even some sort of reward for their loyalty to Mikola. All we know is that oracles appear at the end of each cycle to usher in the new one. I think it's likely that each era's oracles looked vastly different from the ones that preceded them. It makes sense, as their whole thing is that they are a sign that the times they are a change in. Shit, if the theory's true, then they're also the living embodiments of change. They went from being the indentured servants of lordling wizards to the literal heralds of a new age. It honestly couldn't be more fitting for it to be them who became the oracles. They've sort of risen from the ashes, if you will. This is all just fun speculation though, of course. But I think it fits. And before I move on, I do want to say it is at least somewhat possible that the cocoons in the Halleck Tree could be turning the Albinorix into kindred of rot. Now, I don't think that's super possible, but I have to at least mention it because uh, we went into how the uh, Kindred of Rot are uh, bred in a recent video. So while I don't think this is the case, I feel like it's at least somewhat a possibility. Plus, I have a love of presenting alternatives. 
Anyway though, let's get on to the expanded encyclopedia section of this video where I get into the uh, nitty gritty of the Oracle envoys themselves outside of their connection to the Albinorix. So starting off, there's three different types of these jazz musicians. Each one carries a unique golden horn that gets more and more grand each step up, starting from a modest little trumpet flute thing, ending in a giant grand otherworldly saxophone thing. And they use these horns to play a song that generates these golden bubbles that then explode or rather pop and do a bunch of damage, holy damage, to their enemies. And it's actually really cool just how many ways these guys are able to actually use the bubbles as offensive means. It's really quite impressive, even if they weren't the first group of uh, beings that were capable of using bubble magic, but we'll get more on that later. But aside from their unique magic capabilities, the most striking thing about these guys is their appearance. I mean, look at them, covered in soft white threads, while their lower regions are effectively just a ball, which matches their heads. Now, it should be noted, though, that their heads aren't actually that big. It's actually a part of their drip. See, they wear these massive turbans on their heads. The turban also obscures their eyes, allowing their faith to be their sight. And they have skin of silver that looks suspiciously similar to that of Albinorix, while also lacking legs. Which you'd think it would make it difficult for them to get around, but they really don't struggle at all. They've actually developed their own unique movement pattern that incorporates spins and twists. Now the first of the Oracle Envoys, and probably the most plentiful, is the small one with the little mini horn who isn't very dangerous at all, but that doesn't mean they're not a pain in the ass. They can actually use their horn to summon a bubble on the player's person that then explodes and does a bunch of damage, so you know, don't leave your character idle around these guys. They're obviously the most common variant, often being led around by the middle brother of these uh, Envoy Oracles, the Medium Bro. Now this guy wields my favorite of the three Oracle Horns. Something about its spiral design plus its cool ass Ash of War. It's a great weapon that made like my first couple playthroughs of Elden Ring a whole bunch of fun. Honestly can't recommend it enough, even if holy damage is uh, well next to useless in this game. Unless you're fighting like a revenant or something, then it actually comes in handy. But while this one definitely has the best weapon art of the three, the enemy who wields it doesn't use it in the same way. He uses it similarly to the smaller ones in that he spawns a bunch of bubbles on your person where you're standing, so you know, you gotta stay, uh, you gotta be quick on your feet with these guys. Not too hard to avoid though. But these middle bros, they probably have the most style out of all the different Oracle Envoys. They wear this silvery white knit cardigan thing over their uh, silky toilet paper outfit, complete with tassels. It gives them the appearance of having a senior position amongst the oracles. And that does seem to be the role they fill as they're often found leading patrols or leading the symphony. But since these large oracle envoys, the medium bros, are the only ones to wear this extra piece of clothing, there's really only one explanation. This here jacket represents a symbol of my individuality and my belief in personal freedom. Hands down, these guys definitely look the most elegant out of all their uh, counterparts. Anyway, the biggest of these uh, Oracle Envoys is uh, probably the most rare as all, as I can only think of three of these guys, and all three of them are on the branches of Nicholas Halligtree. Venerable Titans known as the Oracle Envoy Giants. As their name suggests, they're frightfully big. And these guys' horns, when wielded by them, are objects of devastation. Unfortunately, we as the player cannot wield the same type of bubble magic that this uh, big bastard is capable of using on us. Which, yeah, sure, it's fairly easy to dodge through. But if you just make one, you know, if you dodge just a little too soon, the amount of damage that these bubbles do is just absolutely egregious. And sure, it might be because I'm on new game plus five or six on the current character I'm doing. But should a bubble, just one of them, do that much damage, really? I don't know. Maybe it's not for me to say. Maybe I should just stick to the uh, lore. Anyway, though, these guys can devastate you if you get hit by even just one of those bubbles. I know I probably overstated it, but they're quite annoying. Anyway, these hulking brutes are different from their smaller counterparts in that they aren't completely covered head to toe in that white cloth, as they evidently don't make an outfit big enough to house this pulsating, bulbous gut they have. It really does look like these guys are about to burst, and I wonder how they get this big. I mean, the fact that there's only three of them in the game seems to indicate that it's a pretty rare occurrence for one of these oracles to have gotten this big. Now, I mentioned earlier that these guys were not the only Ripple users of the land. There exists another race of artificial beings who are able to use a different color of bubble magic, the Claymen. 
Now these guys were priests from the old dynasty who searched for oracles within their bubbles. And true to their name, they are made of clay, so when you kill them, they melt back into a slumpy mound of clay. It's also pretty deceptive though because some of them hide like this and sort of play dead as just a mound of clay and then when you get near them they rise into a clay man and attack you. And these guys have some pretty cool weapons. They throw bolas at you. They have a little unobtainable dagger and of course the uh, obtainable harpoon. Now I think these guys when they served the old dynasty their job was to predict the future like Minority Report. Basically I think they were looking through these bubbles for oracles that signified the end of their age or their dynasty. Perhaps the oracles they were looking for in those bubbles are the oracle envoys who wouldn't show up until long after the old dynasty had crumbled. It's kind of tough to say but it is interesting how they're sort of like rudimentary Albinorix. They don't seem to be silver based like Albinorix or the Mimic Tears, but they're artificial beings and they do appear to be mineral based or at the very least earthen. Now a couple of last minute observations about the Claymen. Their blue magic based bubble seems to indicate that their age had some sort of focus on sorceries of some kind. Or conversely they could have connections to the ancestral followers and their blue magic type shit. But one thing I've noticed is that they seem to revere the malformed stars, and the malformed stars seem to have something in common with madness or frenzy. Because we see at the Yellow Annex ruins that the uh, heavily guarded place full of frenzied individuals is actually guarding the den of a malformed version of Astel Stars of Darkness. Then down here deep beneath the earth we have one frenzied Miranda flower near a bunch of clay men and near a malformed star a weakened one a half formed Estelle. See I'm really gonna have to start that uh, hour long weekly rant video thing soon because I'm getting all these great ideas for it that I don't want to take away too much time in this video to do. I just really like their design they really do look like rudimentary men of clay with this weird bubble like sort of rash like affliction all over their back and spine it's just a uh, it invites speculation and I love it. And these guys know the secret hedgehog technique. They roll. They fucking roll continuously and it's hilarious. They become bolder. But I wanted to keep this video short as like a little mini rant epilogue to yesterday's video. And if it's any longer I probably won't be able to finish editing it by today. So as always I hope you guys found it at least a little informative and entertaining. And if you liked it please like it. If you disliked it please dislike it. And if you like hearing me rant on and on and on please consider subscribing. I got a coffee account if you feel like supporting. But enough of that eBay and let's have our outro and then the final thoughts. And some sneak peeks at what's coming up next. So yesterday I wondered at how Mog was able to bypass the uh, Evergel at Ordina Liturgical Town in the Consecrated Snowfield to gain access to the Halig Tree, and all it took was one Galaxy Brain commenter to point out to me that Mog has wings, so he simply flew past the Evergel and past the ruins of the Liturgical Town to the Halig Tree and swooped up Mikola and went on back to the uh, Mogwin Dynasty. And personally, I think that's the most sensible explanation I've ever heard for how Mog managed to get past all the defenses of the Halig Tree and the Snowfield. Anyway, though, I've got a few smaller videos that are going to come out, and then finally, the Aldia one is uh, coming down the pike, finally. But before we do that, we've got, you know, this video. Uh, I've got another video about a uh, string theory of mine. That's a joke. It's actually about uh, demi-humans. Then I've got the one about the elder spirits that haunt the omens, one about Tanith, how could I forget? Basically I got a lot of Elden Ring themed things, but also I've got some non-Elden Ring stuff, like I have in a Song of Ice and Fire video coming out soon, a Fallout one when the uh, series comes out, a Fallout video game one, and one about a little show called The Gentleman on Netflix that I really enjoyed, but I'm rambling here and this is no longer a bite-sized video now is it? Anyway though, I'll be seeing you guys real soon, I'm really trying to pick up the pace on my upload schedule because I have so many ideas that I want to show you guys. But I'll see you soon. As always, be safe, and I will see you next time.